Good afternoon, Anne. Thanks for joining us. Hello. How is everyone doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. Um, yeah, uh, I just finished class, so. Okay. Like, oh, thank goodness it's from three to four. Like, it's like the most I finished. Yeah, we're just waiting for our two speakers, um, and then we can get started. But we're still early. All right, awesome. Yeah, I know some of, um, I think my other team members should be coming on soon as well, also. Okay, cool. Um, do you guys already know uh, what kind of problem statement you're going to work on? Um, can you elaborate on that? Uh, like for the impact challenge, like what is your business case going to be on? Um, so like, when you, so like essentially like the goal of this impact challenge is like to create a business model, correct? Mm -hmm. So yeah. is it, so should we target our business models for like a certain like industry? So like for restaurants or like um, for beauty and like beauty, like beauty salons and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, we've been throwing like a lot of ideas and we made a survey and we sent it out already. And so we've been like gathering data on like the consumer end and like, I think our hardest um, data, data like collection is coming from like small business owners because oh. I think that's where like the real, like that's where we can really find solutions for. But so far we have been like throwing ideas around as to like, oh, how can we help restaurants bounce back like post pandemic and yeah, so I think our main thing is like the uses of like technology. Only problem is like costs and finances. Or um, for like where I'm from, there are some places opening up like around me. So just seeing how like they handle like what are their COVID guidelines. Those are like another way we try to like gauge at like oh, um, if I was like someone who's quarantining, like how can restaurants or any place sell like the idea of safety to a consumer that they're willing to like spend their money or like that they're willing to use that or like go to that place and like actually like spend something mm -hmm. so it's, like there hasn't been like really a detailed like i'm like the only one talking there hasn't been like a detailed um outline that we have but i think like the start of this webinar would like definitely help us towards like mapping out like our business plan and like, mm -hmm. no. Yeah, that's the whole point of this webinar is to help people pinpoint what kind of problem they want to solve. So yeah, any any questions you have, definitely you can bring them up to the two speakers. Mm -hmm. um, looks like we have some other folks joining, which is great. Sounds good. Um, we are waiting for Ranjan and Kareem. Um, so there are two speakers, but you know what, um, Julia and John, do you guys mind if we start with questions about the impact challenge first while we wait for the speakers? Maybe that's a good use of time. Yeah, it's a great idea. Okay. Um, so it's three o'clock. Actually, let's wait till 3.01. <laughs> three o'clock is a little early for, uh, oh, it's 3.01 now. Okay. Um, all right, well, welcome everyone uh, to the first webinar in the Ascends Impact Challenge 2020. Uh, right now, we're waiting for our two speakers. Uh, their names are Ranjan um, and Kareem. So we'll wait for both of them uh, uh, to start our customer discovery questions. Um, so uh, while we wait for them, though, to make use of our time, uh, we're going to go over the Impact Challenge itself. Um, and. Uh, and then also any questions that you have. Um, and then when we have our speakers, uh, we can ask our, our questions directly to them. And actually we have one right now. Uh, hi, Kareem, thanks for joining us. Of course, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, so thank you so much for joining us. I know that you're on a tight schedule with uh, running a restaurant and all. Um, so we're actually still waiting for our other speaker as well. Do you mind if we start off with you? No, it's fine. Okay. Great. Um, so I'll, I just kicked us off like 30 seconds ago. <laughs> so you didn't miss too much. Um, 
So again, welcome everyone. Uh, this year's Ascend Impact Challenge is about helping small business owners pivot their business model uh, during the pandemic so that not only are they surviving the pandemic, uh, but they're also succeeding, uh, especially where transactions are becoming much more virtual. Uh, so um, experts anticipate a dim outlook for the US economy coming up, um, especially as there's a resurgent of coronavirus um, and that intensifies doubts about econo economic recovery. Uh, so just yesterday, there was um, an AP article that talked about how in the April to June timeframe, the economy sank at roughly 32% annual rate for that quarter. Uh, which is three times worse than the uh, worst quarter already recorded, which was in 1958. Uh, so as consumer spending decreases, as people stay home and avoid shopping, traveling, and gathering crowds, um, you know, obviously uh, business owners need to find out how uh, to survive that and to thrive in that kind of environment. Um, so that's why um, this year the Impact Challenge uh, is about helping small business owners pivot their business model. Um, and this particular webinar is to help us um, as a challenge uh, participant or team uh, to be able to do some customer discovery. Um, and especially during the pandemic, it might be a little bit difficult to um, have access to, um, uh, to people. But uh, today we're lucky to have two business owners. Um, uh, we have Kareem and Ranjan. Um, and they're going to tell us about uh, their experience as a business owner. Hi, Ron John, how are you? Hi. Thank you for Great. joining. How are you? Um, so for the participants, um, there'll be a time for um, you to ask questions. Uh, so um, if you could hold off until uh, Kareem and Ron John are, are done uh, with what they have to say. Um, we want to use this time for problem curation. So think about what problem are you actually trying to solve? Um, and also, as you're thinking about what your business case is going to be, um, you want to gain empathy for the business owner. Uh, so whether it's helping them gain uh, revenue, attract customers, um, or, um, or maybe it's reducing their costs somehow. Um, when we talk about empathy, uh, there is an emotional component to that. So we want to think about um, as they are going through uh, this pandemic, uh, what, what is the problem that they are trying to get at? Um, so we want to put as much time as possible uh, for their talks and the questions that you might have for them. So uh, we'll start off with Kareem. Uh, so Kareem is from New York City. He's co-founder of Melt Bakery, New York's first ice cream sandwich store. It opened in 2010 with $350 towards ingredients and kitchen rental. And now it's become a gourmet enterprise with shops in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and additional seasonal locations around New York City. So Kareem, uh, if you can begin and, uh, and sure. start off, thank you. Um, sure, so I have a sort of a list of questions I guess you sent over, so I just go through them and speak a little bit about the business. Is that the, the best course? Um, Perfect. So the background on Melt Bakery, Melt Bakery, we're, we're a pretty simple business, just an ice cream sandwich company. So all we do is ice cream sandwiches, two cookies with ice cream in between them. Um, we don't let people mix and match. We probably have over a hundred flavors and we usually only offer four or five at a time at a cart, but we have more than that if you were to order online. Um, so, you know, how COVID has changed our business or impacted customers. Um, we've taken a pretty serious hit. So the way we distribute ice cream sandwich are, we own a few retail shops. Um, we also have seasonal locations. For example, there's a very popular park on the west side of Manhattan called the High Line, um, which has 90,000 people walking on it a day or a weekend. So, and then we do large scale events. So we're at City Field when the Mets play, we do the US Open, we do Madison Square Garden. Um, and then we have about 60 wholesale clients and those range from Citarella, which is a gourmet grocery store to the local coffee shop um, to movie theaters. So just looking at what I named, movie theaters aren't open, Broadway's closed, there are no sports facilities that are open. So our wholesale business went from, you know, a slow winter to turning off completely when COVID hit. Um, and so those are, those are our customers are severely impacted as were we. And many of our retail locations haven't been able to open. So the parks in Manhattan aren't doing food programs. 
Um, so what we've limited our footprint to just the retail establishments we currently own. Um, so we do, uh, the other two pillars of the business side from re retail and, and wholesale are we do, you know, weddings, birthday parties and whatnot. Those gatherings have also slowed a lot. So that's a third leg of the stool that's fallen down. And then, however we do, we have picked up a lot in uh, pickup and delivery services, whether that be us fulfilling delivery and shipping on dry ice and coolers or using a Postmates or an Uber Eats or one of the delivery services that are out there. Um, but I think all of their businesses have slowed, especially in an area like Manhattan. Many people have left the city for the summer or they have a secondary house. So there are just less people consuming in a city like New York than there were previously and, and consumers are more cautious. So those are some of the challenges uh, we've, we've kind of been facing. Um, talking about the advantages of our businesses or our business, our product is, first of all, we're a dairy manufacturing facility, technically, according to the government's eyes. So we're actually regulated both by city organizations as well as the federal government. So we, we produce everything in one facility. It is packaged fully. There is no food handling on site. So nobody ever touches that ice cream sandwich outside of that facility. And that facility is more stringently managed than a restaurant is from a inspections perspective. So that, for example, they take bacterial analysis of all of our ice cream and our cookies. So communicating that to consumers and saying, like, how do I know the food is safe and it hasn't been touched by many people um, I think we have an advantage compared to many other businesses that are prepping food on site, or you're not sure how your food got to your table, if you will. Um, so that's, that's one of the advantages. And because things are prepackaged and our, our menu is limited, we can also service customers pretty quickly. So when you think about gathering you know, in a park or in a line, to choose one of four things and have a round dollar kind of payment and have contactless payment, it's a much safer experience. You don't have gatherings of people in a store, you know, after dinner, if, if people are going for dessert. So I think the transaction process, as well as the, the manufacturing process that we have in place are advantage to some other businesses that are currently in the, in the hospitality industry. Um, as far as trends in our industry impacting business decisions, uh, Hospitality in general has just taken a serious hit. I think ice cream in general has taken a serious hit. Um, there is what I'll call uh, sort of like the Ben and Jerry's of the, this generation is a, a company called Ample Hills, which I know well. They just spent a lot of money and built a, a multi-million dollar production facility in Brooklyn and Red Hook. And in March, they filed for bankruptcy. Um, and so, you know, it's impacted many businesses in hospitality as well as in the ice cream business pretty dramatically. Uh, and so, so we've, we've been able to weather the storm, but we think about it as not only like us, our product, our consumers, like we have locations, those locations have landlords behind them. We need to make sure we can pay our rent so their businesses are stable. We source a lot of our ingredients from in and around New York City. So our purveyors, we're still trying to buy whatever we can from local and small businesses. Everything from printing the sign on the outside of our store, instead of going online, we're trying to help the print shop down the street. So there is a, there is a socially responsible element given that all of those businesses have supported us. We're trying to do whatever we can to kind of support them as we're all starting to get back to whatever this new normal may be. Um, the government's decisions, we've been beneficial to receive a number of the, the loans or grants that the government has made available. Um, my background is more in finance than it is in food. I think it's great that some of the loans are forgivable uh, and you're able to keep staff on longer and you're able to kind of it essentially bridges you to the economy reopening, but if the economy doesn't reopen and people don't become consumers like they were, it's only delaying what's inevitably going to happen. And I feel like that's sort of happening with many businesses. They're kind of coming to the end of the PPP program. Maybe they got the SBA EIDL loan, but that has interest on it. And if people don't start buying their product, the loans are only helping them with the expenses. It's not helping them with the revenue line. So, you know, while I know what the intent is and there were some stumbling blocks, I think the, the consumer is what's gonna save everything, not a loan program or a government program from my perspective. Um, tech savviness, 
I would put us probably in the upper quartile or upper, upper decile. So we, you know, all payroll is online, all of our time clocking is online, our inventory, our recipe databases, our images, our POS systems are all contact lists. Um, I can pretty much run the entire business on my cell phone if I needed to, and I have visibility into where people are, what we're making, um, all that, you know, and we obviously we have like camera systems. So it's not as technologically enabled as a tech company, as a web company might be, where there's a Google Analytics dashboard. But for a hospitality business, I think we have, we have a lot of tech and we use a lot of, a lot of uh, web-based services to help us out. Um, I think those were the majority of the questions. I'm happy to answer any questions or if I skipped over anything COVID related, feel free to just ask me and I'll, I'll do my best to answer. All right, uh, so we can uh, open it up uh, real quick for some questions. There'll be more Q&A time after Aranjan speaks, um, but if anyone has anything right now, they can go ahead and ask. Um, I had a question. Um, so you said how, like right now, like you said, like at this point, your company is tech savvy and you can operate everything on the phone. So like how long did that shift from like not using as much technology to being able to like say you can like function the business remotely? Um, we we actually didn't implement any more tech as a result of COVID. We had everything in place pre-COVID. So just the nature of our business, you know, I have, you know, call it 40 employees that work in remote locations and they need things, whether it be, you know, ice cream sandwiches are melting or, or I need to run to the restroom or someone from the Department of Health came. So we had to put in place both communication mechanisms as well as like requests for material mechanisms, as well as just knowing where people are, like making sure that someone actually is at Washington Square Park selling sandwiches. Otherwise we might lose our license with the parks department. Um, so we've always kind of looked, you know, almost on an annual basis at what we use for technology and then how we can improve in order to sort of track the business uh, with best practices, right? Even, even our accounting is QuickBooks, which is we're using the online version. Um, so COVID didn't result in more tech it actually just made us a little bit more comfortable that we had all the tech in place we needed to monitor these things. So we had the information we needed to try to figure out what decisions we could make or should make um, as a result of COVID. Okay, yeah, thank you. That was uh, really insightful. Can you speak to the technology you're using to track the um, employees that you were talking about? Uh, yes, yeah, so we've gone through a couple different services. Right now, the, the service we're using is called Deputy. Um, it's just deputy.com. Um, we've used a number of them over over the years. There's a there's a bunch of scheduling services. It depends on the the type of uh, functionality you need. Um, we use Square for our POS. We've tried a couple of the POS services. Square also has a scheduling service. Um, you know, we needed something with geolocation, um, and we needed something that wasn't only smartphone. Um, accessible because we can't require all of our employees carry smartphones. Um, so that's what we use for scheduling. But I'm happy if you had specific questions on what we use for random things. I mean, I think one of the most widely used things is just uh, we have a Dropbox account and a Google account, like, a, and we most of our files are on there. So what's getting produced in the kitchen, what our recipes are, what should be in kits, uh, all that stuff is just common documents which the management team looks at. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Ann and Kareem. Uh, so let's move on to Ranjan. Uh, Ranjan, thank you so much for joining us. I know this is your lunch hour, so it's probably the busiest hour for you. So I appreciate that you're joining us. Uh, so Ranjan, Ranjan oh, go ahead. I said it's my pleasure. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, Ranjan's coming to us from San Francisco. He's chef and owner of New Delhi Restaurant opened in 1988, and uh, they have several awards and acclaims. Um, they're known for their excellent Indian cuisine, and they're also known for hosting political dignitaries, as well as food and beverage industry celebrities. So Ranjan, if you could take it away. Sure. So New Delhi Restaurant, we are the oldest Indian restaurant in the city of San Francisco now. Uh, there were a few before us, but they all closed their doors. We're also a legacy business, 
we are recognized by the city of San Francisco, what makes the soul of the city of San Francisco, which is really cool, you know. Um, and we are a Asian mixed family immigrant business. Um, our whole focus is to make sure we are deeply involved with the community and we give back to the community because that's from where we are reaping. Uh, COVID has really changed our business. Our business uh, in the same location, we have been in the same location for 32 years. Uh, um, and we are located right downtown. And uh, our whole, uh, you know, uh, demographic is for people who are in the San Francisco, also in the Bay Area, but the majority is the 25 major hotels, which is within like two blocks of our restaurant. All those hotels are closed. Mainly 80% uh, of our business is from tourists. These are international tourists and local tourists. Out of the international and local tourists, there are a lot of people who are very regular because they come back to the city all the time. But those hotels are all boarded up. So suddenly we are relying on that 20% and we need to expand that 20%. Also, New Delhi restaurant has been all about the experience. You know, it's a, it's a luxury category. It's all about coming, seeing the celebrity chef. It's all about having an amazing experience, which we can't provide anymore. We have to figure out something else to keep our kind of livelihood. Um, also, I'm very blessed. I have core staff of six with me who have been with me for 26 years. So it's way more than just family, you know? So I want to make sure they are safe, they're well, and they can survive. These are families which we have been together for so many years, and we are going to be together for many, many, many more years. And so that's where my priority is. So talking about experience, therefore, is about a nostalgic experience. When you come to the restaurant, it's all about seeing this old cash register, writing everything by hand, talking to you about, you know, the whole experience, the menu and all of that. But now we have to change everything. We have to become digitally savvy. So what we did was actually start a virtual kitchen because doors were closed. So we launched what we call curbside curry. So curbside curry does delivery and pickup. It, we are also using Square. Before the COVID, we did use the Square just for payment, not the POS system or anything like that. Everything was by hand, everything was manual. But we have invested to create a complete digital POS system from Square. Also, we have created QR code for the menu. So if you go to the online store, we have two online store. One is curbside curry. And then we have um, also a uh, new Delhi restaurant. So the QR code, we have a sandwich board outside. When people are coming in, they want to order something, they can just scan that QR code and they can go right to new Delhi restaurant and they can order the menu from there. Also, in future, as we prepare to open the door, we are going to have a QR code for each table. So we have like 13 tables. So table number one will have a special QR code and you can scan the menu from right there and you can order. And so there is no touch and the order will go to the kitchen. There is one in the kitchen, one in the front of the house and it will come right to you. So. You know, all these things, we are reinventing ourselves. I definitely, totally, deeply believe every disaster has a seed of opportunity. It's up to you how you want to look at it and pivot, be creative, and come up with a solution 
and perhaps you can come out stronger on the other side. Now, what are the biggest challenges now and what have been easy to overcome? Like nothing has been easy to overcome. Right now, from 1st of May until now, no, uh, 15th of April until now, 600 restaurants has closed in downtown, San, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And these are restaurants who have been around for 83 years, 50 years, 40 years, 20 years, 15 years. Just the other day, two of my friends, there's a husband and wife team, they had a, like a bakery and an Italian restaurant, and AJ decided he can't deal with this anymore and took his own life. So, you know, when you ask me what is the effect, it's a very deep effect. It's something which we are going through. Many of the future generations will come to realize that that is a COVID survivor and that's not. So we have to be really, really creative to come up with solution to overcome this. Um, the biggest challenge for me has been to sustain because, you know, small businesses, we are very small business, one restaurant. We don't have deep pockets. How do we overcome? So I had in the beginning a GoFundMe. I reached out to the community. We are deeply involved in the community in many, many ways. We are always helping all nonprofit issues, all Asian issues. We have a charity of our own called Compassionate Chefs Cafe. And what is Compassionate Chefs Cafe? We help 300 kids across the street in the Tenderloin, where it's the worst neighborhood, and we connect them with about 3,000 kids across from Gandhi Ashram to become global citizen. And every seven years, we get a chance to bring about 16 kids and seven chaperones from India to meet these kids here in Tenderloin in San Francisco. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a long three, four, five years journey because the people, the kids from the slums in India, they don't even have birth certificate. So we have to go through this whole process of from birth certificate to passport to visas and all of that. But we never tell them that they're coming here. We put together a dance drama and it is a message of Mahatma Gandhi that we can overcome anything and everything in a nonviolent way. And then they go to 11 different cities in India and perform that and share it in the slums, you know. So when we get those visas and everything, it is not about coming seeing San Francisco. It's all about sharing a message with these other kids. So we have been doing it for a very long time. So I reached out to my community and asked them, can you please help? I need some funds to just sustain because I want to pay my core staff so they can keep on, you know, like living their livelihood. So, and it happened. I raised about $20,000. And that gave me that little edge until we got the PPP loans and the SBA loans. Without that, it would not have happened. We would not have survived. So I count my blessing on those. So that was one of the biggest challenge. And uh, how has it been easy to overcome? No, it hasn't been easy to overcome. One of the things we did was I have three people who have worked in my kitchen and I have three people who have worked in the front of the house. So now I'm scheduling two, one of them every two days in the kitchen and one of them in the front of the house every two days. That's way, that way everybody's far away from each other. There's no two people and it's safe and we can make sure everybody stays well. And we are doing um, all the third party deliveries. So it's the Postmates the Uber Eats, the Grubhub, the DoorDash, Caviar, and that's the New Delhi restaurant platform. Then we created another platform, which is curbside curry. So now I can have a little bit bigger pie 
bigger piece of pie, you know, of the Indian cuisine, because I have to, I have to create this whole new revenue stream because nobody is dining in anymore. And then we had to come up with things like, how do I tell people? So we have a campaign, two different campaigns, one uh, for New Delhi restaurant, one for curbside curry through the Facebook, through the Google, but then we focused and made sure that we can just share this information with people with, who are within three miles of the re restaurant. So we can get more repeat business. We can have a new revenue stream. Um, that has been going really well. And then we put stuff on other medias and, uh, you know, see how we can attract new people. Um, that has been really, really challenging, but it has been very, very, very hard. Um, what are the current trends impacting your business decisions? Um, the current trend, you know, every business is so different. For us, we have always been a place where you come for, for an experience. So we are doing a lot of things um, on virtual media, on Zoom. I am a keynote speaker, very, very, uh, you know, I, I am very busy with keynote speaking, whether it is about the cuisine or the culture or about social justice. And I am on all different platforms. I am doing one uh, on 18th of August with Asia Society is cooking with Ranjan Day. And they gave me a uh, complimentary code. So usually they will be charging $15. So I use that to reach out to all my friends. And, uh, you know, we have about 28,000 people on our email list. So I reached out to them and said, hey, look, here is a free code for you to come join me and, uh, you know, enjoy cooking with Ranjan Day. But can you donate to help feed your hospital. And this way it can become a win-win situation. You know, uh, feeding, feed your hospital program has been very helpful for us. This is the time we need any, every help. And if we can have that help a little bit more often, right now we are doing once a month or something like that. I mean, it will be amazing if we can do it once a week or twice a week it will go a long way to give us a helping hand to, you know, get back up again. Um, so some of these things are the most important thing. Um, and I would love to see if you have any question and uh, see how I can answer. Great, thank you so much, Ranjan. Uh, so I'll open it up to the folks on the line. Um, if you have any questions for both Kareem or Ranjan, uh, please uh, take it away. And you can also chat, uh, uh, place it in chat, and we'll uh, sort through those as well. So just unmute yourself, and, and you can speak. Sure. This is Will. Uh, hey, uh, Chef Ranjan. Uh, great that you adapted technology so, uh, so quickly to bring your business up to speed. So mainly your business has been on uh, dining city. Uh, right, in, in terms of seating in the restaurant. So you kind of adapted quickly to also handle curbside and delivery. Did you build out the, the uh, curbsidecurry.com as a separate because of the high commissions charged by the other platforms and that, that, uh, that provide a service? There are two different ways I've been handling that. Yes, it's very high commission charged. So there is a way through, through Square now we have created a service where we can deliver to you in San Francisco within several miles for $3. I mean, actually it's going to cost us about $6 to $7. I'm splitting it. I'm letting customer pay only $3. I'm absorbing the rest of it. But then if somebody is ordering $50 or more, I'm just eating the whole thing. And then I'm not paying any commission. I'm not paying 30% commission. That way I can make it attractive. So if you, if you see that, um, you know, little flyer 
uh, I started by saying $3 delivery charge, say, you know, save and help a local family uh, business. So we are doing that. We're trying to be very, very savvy in that area. I definitely believe change is inevitable, right? But growth is optional. And that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. So Kareem, same question, because you're, you're not, not so much a, a restaurant, but you're mostly delivery of a few stores, uh, and you were pretty tech savvy originally. So have you uh, had adapted a different platform to do the same without paying the commissions? We haven't. I mean, so the, the platforms have put incentives in place, so you could advertise at the highest tier for a less revenue share but they're they're all very expensive right so if you just if you take the whole restaurant industry a restaurant that has over 30 percent margins is like a rock star restaurant and mm -hmm. seamless grubhub all these people take 30 percent off the bat so you know it, it's an additional revenue stream that maybe takes a little less cost to fulfill but it's not like if we built a tech solution it would actually be that much different because they own the customer right the customer is coming in through some of those platforms so we've used all of them some with more success than others, but we haven't looked to develop our own or like come up with a hybrid solution, right? We haven't, we haven't done anything to try to lower our commissions. We've just tried to be more active when we advertise. Thank them. you. I want to say something to you, Will. You know, what we are doing right now, we are trying to convert these customers who are coming from DoorDash and Uber Eats. The way we are trying to do it, we have created a flyer and the flyer says $3 delivery charge, help a local business. And we are putting that inside the bag, which DoorDash is coming to collect and deliver to the customer. That way that customer will see this and come back to us, hopefully, and give us a helping hand. And that's why we are trying to be creative. I mean, right now we are flat on our catering. You know, we do about 60 Indian wedding business every year. We do about 30, 40 corporate events. There's nothing, there's no convention. So we are just trying really hard to figure out a way to come back up again, at least cover our costs. And so this is another way we're trying to grab that data because we were not going to get that data, but it's like a cost of doing business. So I can just get that data back and convert that into my direct customer. Let's take uh, one of the questions from chat. Uh, would you say that one of the restauranteurs biggest challenges right now is having to pay rent lease on space that they're unable to fully utilize? Absolutely, yes. Um, we do, I, I want to say that I feel blessed uh, with the universe. We have a fantastic landlord. They have given us a long extension they're not pushing for us to pay the rent right now. So we have got this time, but we ultimately have to pay it. Um, so we will just have to wait and see. Um, I think we are not going to get back up again, at least for one and a half to two years. And uh, by the time it's one and a half, two years, I think it's going to get back to what was normal before. Maybe, maybe not. You know, I could be totally wrong. I don't know. But that's where I'm really pinning my flag. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, for us, we don't have tipped employees. So all our employees are either hourly or salary. So that's a big fixed cost. And then rent is another big fixed cost. Uh, we also had a very good landlord and I kind of proactively renegotiated our lease terms, um, just saying we need this or we may not be here. So I was able to do that early on at one location and the other location uh, proactively essentially reduced our rent by 50% for a series of months and then offered to extend at no escalation charge and essentially said, just let us know when you can afford to pay, you've been good tenants. So I've been in a very fortunate situation as they're both willing to work with us because our success or our ability to try to succeed without worrying about how we're going to pay rent ultimately pays them back. So if they have faith in you, um, they, they usually will work with you, assuming you have a good relationship. Uh, Joe, did you, uh, did that answer your question or did you need to follow up with another question? 
Yeah, that answered my question. Thank you okay, great. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? And Kareem uh, and Ranjan, you guys could ask each other questions as well if you want. <laughs> I had a question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Please, please go ahead. I had a question in terms of um, the employee retention. So you mentioned, Ranjan, that you've had a six core employees of 26 years. And Kareem, you mentioned that you had 40 employees or so. Very. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm assuming that you, you've had a successful, you guys both been able to build a successful business. So how have you been able to keep the morale? How do you keep them employed? Pre-COVID too, right? Like even during COVID, um, how do you build that culture basically? Um, Rajan, do you want to go first or you want me to go first? Go ahead first. Okay. Um, so we have, you know, when I mentioned the 40 number, I would say 30 of them are more variable because they're more the flexible sales staff that comes on spring through fall. Sure. And then we have a core team of call it 10 to 12 people. Um, we've done our absolute best to keep that 10 to 12 fully employed. So um, part of the things we've done to accommodate are, for example, the, the woman who runs our kitchen has a daughter and she didn't feel like uh, the caretaker for the daughter was taking the necessary safety precautions. So she asked if she could switch her schedule to work nights instead of days because she could produce whenever, but she wanted to be home during the day to homeschool her daughter. So we've done everything we can do to accommodate schedule changes. We've also had other employees. One of our head uh, salespeople is very asthmatic and it was better for her to be on unemployment. She would make more money, would not essentially be risking you know, customers coming in and out. So if that was a better choice for her, she went on unemployment, she took that and then she's committed to coming back to us. So the morale is hard when you don't have excited people coming in to buy your product, but we have a team that sort of supported one another. And then as business owners, we've tried to do everything we can to make sure that they didn't have to worry about how they were going to be able to fund, you know, their liabilities, their rent, their childcare, their schooling, their transportation and things like that. Yeah, you know, for me, you know, I'm not going to boost my morale for COVID. I mean, this is a, it, this is my style. My style is a family business. We're going to take care of you. You take care of us, you know, and it's never like you take care of us first and then I will do something for you. No, it's never been that style. I work shoulder to shoulder with all of them. We are here during the happy time, during the very, very deep, you know, painful time and in between. And it is your intention. If your intention is pure to support, everybody sees it. Of course, you have a, a line of staff. I mean, if you've been in business for this long, who have tried to screw you left, right, and center. But they are far and in between. Most of the people are there because we have been there for them, and they are here for us. So it's not because of COVID, we are trying to do something to boost morale or anything. This is how we work every day. Thanks. Kareem, it's really nice to meet you over this. I would love to come see you in New York one of these days. And I would love for you to come see me if you're coming to San Francisco. Have Sorry, you I'd I say normally I get to go to San Francisco once or twice a year. So, but I haven't been oh. going. Next time I'm there, I'll definitely let you know. Yeah, that would be cool. Have you guys thought about targeting individual neighborhoods? I know San Fran, New York is probably not quite like where I am in Houston in the suburbs, but like we have pretty strong HOA associations. Um, where they actively, I know, Ron John, you mentioned, you know, like going on Facebook and promoting your business, but when you're able to go and target one neighborhood, you know, right, so like Tuesday night's Indian food and hopefully 10 or 12 families all order there and you can deliver in batch quantities, right, individual portions, but batch quantities and you just hit up like one street might be a lot easier than, might be something to consider. Because I see that yeah, working out I mean, here. Theory-wise, it's a great idea. Uh, yeah. Practical-wise, it's very difficult. Imagine me calling you. You're at home. And I'm calling you suddenly. I'm saying, hey, will you get together with your neighbor and put together an order? Right? Like, no. 
just leave me alone. <laughs> but if I know you, yep. maybe you will help me, especially if we have history. But the other way to do it is through technology. Like all our Facebook postings and all our ads and our Google ads has specific zip codes. Mm -hmm. the zip code which we have is within three miles of it, of our restaurant. And so we focus there with a really, really good offer. And we are always trying to do this, you know, and then get data. I mean, doing family thing is only good if we have an inroad with somebody. Otherwise, people look at us like, what are you trying to do? <laughs> you can't just suddenly call me from the blues just because you want a business, you know? I mean, where have you been all these years? Yeah. So. But the thing is, we have been very, very effectively community centered. So we do have a lot of people. Like I was saying, I have 28,000 people on my email list. Mm -hmm. That's like a little city, you know, and it didn't happen overnight. It happened over 32 years. So sometimes the ideas we have to, as a business man, we have to figure out, I mean, if I have to do that, I would have to actually try and talk to somebody. Right now, it's impossible to do it because when I'm talking to you face to face, it's a different kind of response than when you receive something on digital media. Sure. Definitely, you won't allow me to zoom you suddenly, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we have to see what is the most effective because I'm a very small business. I'm already wearing so many hats. I have to make sure I can do something where my return, I can see a little bit more. Because I am facing no's, no, 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 all the time already. So I'm trying to go on a channel where I will have at least a little bit of yes, then no. It's sort of the same. And we, we're on the Lower East Side where we grew up. Um, and started the business. There's a business improvement district which we're involved in. So they've, you know, they've shut down the streets on a certain day and they've marketed. And we've gone out to all the local people and tried to drum up interest. Um, one of the things is there's there's a group started by a woman. It's uh, it's called Creatives for Kitchens. And what she actually did is she went out to many different creative types. So copywriters, graphic designers, UX UI professionals. And they're all donating their time to hospitality businesses for free. And so we just had our second meeting. So we have six professionals that have worked with huge brands globally. And they're essentially working for us gratis. And they're like, what is your number one challenge? And they're doing everything from designing new copy to doing a website audit, to figuring out how we should communicate on social, what hashtags we should use, you know, where our traffic is currently coming from and are they discovering what they want? and then how we can highlight maybe different parts of our offering via the web uh, in, in this new area, in new era, as opposed to how we would offer things. So that's been beneficial. We haven't implemented anything yet, but one of the questions was, you know, your product's COVID friendly, are you marketing that? We're not actually coming out and saying, eat us, we're safe, but we are trying to say, you know, summer's not dead, come out and eat ice cream, you know, go take a walk. You know, there, there's lots of things like you can kind of get back to your life in a safe way. Um, and don't forget about, you know, the old life you used to have. So we're trying to work on messaging like that, as opposed to, you know, we're hyper sterile. Don't worry. Do they have a San Francisco branch? I would love to see if... Uh... I'll, I'll ask, we have a small group in New York called The Sweet Up. It plays off meetup.com and it's all food brands. Um, and it's knowledge sharing. Do you have a plumber? Where do you get your packaging done? And, and one of the women um, in the group was contacted randomly. And so we had to apply to it. Um, but I've spoken to her. Let me, I'll, I'll check in with her and then I'll circle back with you if they have, if they have okay. capacity or whatever. I'm happy to, I'm happy to forward that along. That would be great. Yeah, we are doing tamper evident. You know, we're going, doing all this um, uh, delivery and pickup of food and we have a tamper evidence sticker which goes on the food so nobody else is handling it it's contactless and the packaging is sealed so if a third party is picking it up and delivering it you can be sure that it is completely sealed and hasn't been you know tampered with and the second part to it is like 
uh, we reached out to the city of San Francisco because we are a legacy business. Um, what does that mean? That means there is a register in the city of San Francisco where they invite you to become a part of this registry. You have to be in business for 30 years. You have to be really involved in the community and you have to be really good at what you're doing. So we were invited. We are the only Indian business and Indian restaurant on that registry. And in the whole history, there's only been 239 such businesses and on that registry. Um, on, on January 27th of this year, that's when we got inducted. Um, so I approached the city of San Francisco, send out a like a, a email to their database to talk about our uh, legacy business and how every, you know, if can they give us a helping hand so we can survive. And so they have been doing that for me, uh, which just goes out to a huge number of database. I don't have um, any, uh, you know, like any, any uh, inroads too. So these are all new uh, eyeballs. Uh, so that has been helpful and they are doing it every four weeks for me. So that is really, really big help. Okay, great. Uh, we probably have time for two more questions at most. Uh, does anyone have anything else? I have one question actually, um, either for Ranjan or Kareem. Um, has your Chamber of Commerce helped you at all in, in helping navigate? Uh, and if yes, then how? For me, no. Okay. It, uh, uh, you know, it hasn't, uh, they didn't reach out to us or do any, any, anything like that. Uh, we just, I think as small business, we have to be resilient by ourselves and we can only rely on ourselves. Right. Um, there are amazing lights like uh, Feed Your Hospital program. I love that. I love that and I want to give back as much as, as I can because that's a bright light during this time. Today, I, in the morning, I did 25 meals for Kaiser Permanente San Francisco or feed your hospitals in the morning today. So that was great. Um, is there anyone from feed your hospital that would want to speak about like 30 seconds about what it is since we've mentioned it a couple of times already? Somebody might be on. Well, feed your hospital is an organization which is actually collecting donations from individuals, from corporations, and then turning around and helping restaurants by, by paying them, you know, $13 per, uh, you know, lunch boxes. And then they take it and deliver it to different hospitals around in the Bay Area. It is in New York and here in San Francisco and in between. So it's an amazing program. It definitely infuses some cash for us to see how we can get a little help. Yeah, it's a great organization. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I'll look well, into it. We didn't, I, I was unaware of that. What we were doing is we actually, uh, one, we have a lot of customers that are in healthcare, so we donated, but then we matched any order we would just donate. So if you ordered 50 sandwiches, we would deliver 50 sandwiches. If you ordered 100 sandwiches, we would deliver. And we just picked hospitals. We called them coordinated. And then we just gratis, essentially, gave it to the hospital just to help the healthcare workers, essentially. Um, but I, it's nice that there's the reverse program where the healthcare workers are yeah. trying to help the restaurants. So Yeah, so they are helping the healthcare workers and recognizing that they're putting their life online to save humanity and also helping the restaurants, yep. you know, in the process. That's great. So. Awesome. Well, uh, we wanted to leave uh, five minutes for the participants to ask questions about the challenge itself. Uh, Kareem and Ranjan, I know you guys are super tight on time, so you can stick around if you want, um, but you're welcome to leave if you have to. I, I can stay for 15 minutes. That's good. And if okay. there's any question from any one of the participants, I okay. am here too. 
Rajan, it was great meeting you. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I actually have to run, but I appreciate the, the opportunity. And if any additional questions, feel free to reach out to me. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kareem. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, so for everyone else, um, if you have questions about the challenge itself, uh, you can unmute yourself or, again, put it in the chat. Um, and this is questions about the challenge statement, uh, how to form teams, uh, whatever it is uh, to help you understand how you can um, uh, uh, compete in this challenge. Uh, yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, um, are there guidelines or like formatting or layouts that uh, y'all would like to see uh, with the, like with the document submissions, the PowerPoint submissions and the video submissions? Yeah, hi, this is Julia. So thanks for the question. Um, just yesterday, I think we posted on the um, event site a PDF that you can download, uh, submission guidance. So it'll give you a business plan template um, as well as like format for how to submit and where to submit. Okay, All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Right. any other questions? Hi, so um, I was just wondering if a professional member is needed for each group or is it just a personal thing? Like, Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, we were wondering if um, a professional Ascend member was needed for each group or is it just a student is just needed as a student? Ascend just member? one or the other, yeah. we At first we had wanted one of each, but then realized that might be a little bit difficult to a barrier to entry so just one or the other will be fine and in fact if you're an interested person um, who is going to become a member later on that's also okay we can address that <laughs> um, during the challenge okay thank you right just one one member out of the team has to be a sudden right that's right okay so can you just explain how the challenge works so like I literally just signed up for a send membership like a week ago, maybe. I'd heard about it and I participated in a couple of workshops, I think around a year ago. And then more recently I decided to join. And then this was of course the first um, webinar that came out. And so I hopped on thinking that it was gonna be more talking about the actual challenge and what it's gonna be involved um, and not realizing that Ranjan and Kareem was gonna join, um, which has been really interesting. So I'm new, I need help. Hold my hands. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing, Wendy. We're <laughs> happy to. Um, so you've signed up. Great first step. Uh, now you need a team. Team can consist of two to five members. Only one of them needs to be an Ascend member. Um, once you've got your team gathered, then you want to come up with a team name and um, join our Slack workspace, which is in the, um, the instructions for that are in the participant packet that you get when you register through the Google form. Um, and then you just start thinking. So this is the first step, sort of having the conversations with people like Ranjan, Kareem, um, other local businesses, and then your group has, your team has to kind of decide what direction are we going to go in? How are we um, going to innovate? this business model. Um, and the submission guidelines, like I said, are posted on the website. So you just have to download that and you'll be coming up with not only a business plan with your team, but a slide deck, like eight to 10 slides, I think we've said, um, as well as a two minute video pitch. So that two minute video pitch will go um, into the semifinal rounds and you'll get uh, judged by a panel of judges. <laughs> Four or five of those semi-finalists will become finalists from there and we'll go on, we'll do a little bit more training on prototyping um, and coming up with sort of a, a showable product for the final rounds in September. Um, and then at the final round, we'll have one grand prize winner. Just to clarify, that video pitch is basically your, your business plan that you're presenting in, in the video format, right? That's right. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. I have to leave, so thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Really you All the best to everybody. Thank you. Thank you for including me. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Uh, I had a question, real quick. Um, is there any limit on the scope of the uh, uh, proposal? Like, um, say you wanted to you know, have multiple phases in the business plan or 
um, you know, a, a ceiling dollar amount for what the um, uh, anticipated budget might be? Uh, Christine or John or Una, jump in if you want to correct me, but I would say no um, and only caveat that with keeping in mind, you'll want to keep in mind the judging criteria. So you have between now and the 23rd, August 23rd, to come up with an idea that you want to be competitive in these criteria, real world application, relevance, potential for impact, you know, creativity, scalability, um, and then multi-generational inclusion. So if you're, I, I guess, you know, what I'm trying to say is I, if I were a participant, I would limit the scope only based on, you know, how can we do something well <laughs> and meet the criteria? Is that fair? Okay, yep. And was the budget question about what you would spend or what the business would spend? Um, either or. Um, just, I'm just looking for if, if there are any sort of uh, limits at all on, uh, on the uh, scope of the plan. No. Uh, so in terms of budget, I wouldn't spend uh, money on uh, the competition. Um, I mean, that's just a recommendation. I guess you, you could if you wanted to. Um, and then, uh, like uh, Julia was saying about the criteria for the budget um, for the business itself, uh, that's part of the, the reality, um, like is it scalable, is it practical uh, criteria. Great, thanks. Uh, um, any other questions? Uh, well, if you've already registered, I would highly recommend uh, being part of uh, Slack. Um, so there you can talk to other people to talk about teaming. Uh, there's a good number of people that just joined without a team. So you can definitely, you know, meet somebody and, and brainstorm about an idea that you want to work on together. There's a, there's a teaming channel in Slack. Uh, so you can do that. Um, and then if you have any questions, uh, reach out to us. Um, our email address that we just stood up, what is it, Julia? <laughs> Challenge at ascendleadership.org. Okay, and we'll, ch we'll uh, put it in the chat too so that you guys can uh, see it. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out to us and uh, we're, we're responsive, um, we're pretty responsive, so we'll get to that as soon as we can. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, we are really excited to be able to converse with you between now and August. Um, and excited to see what kind of innovation comes out of this group. So thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks. Have a All great right. day. Uh, Y'all have a great day.